Welcome to the eighth video in the genetic video series. This video is on incomplete codometer. Before you watch this video, you want to have done quite a bit of pre work, um, which really ends with uh, multiple traits of information that we went through. So, how do you track multiple phenotypic items that you're looking for in terms of eye color, hair color, and like all at the same time? Uh, and then using multiplication tables to find one common probability at the end. Uh, there's parts of the quiz for incomplete and codominance which are going to require you to know how to do multiple traits at the same time. So you definitely want to make sure that you're comfortable with multiple traits before you move on to the correct part of the quiz. So you can follow along with this video on the incomplete and codominance uh, handout that is in your packet. There's some times that the video will pause and ask you to work on some of those questions. You want to make sure that you have a handy technical pause in the future. As a quick review, remember that we just all started with DNA. It's a sequence of nucleic acids that are going are to give us a, kind of a series of information or a code that will allow our body to make specific proteins. Those proteins are then going to control all the phenotypes, the look, the physical traits that we have in our body. We also talked about some basic phenotypes and how you would track those. For example, um, brown eyes and blue eyes of our kids that we have up here. We're also able to use this uh, great tool called the Punnett Square to track how those probabilities would then move through uh, from parent to offspring, and we can calculate percentages from them. We also were given this tool called Punnett Square Steps to Success. I would say by this point you want to start to move away from using this sheet as uh, your ability to track Punnett Square. Uh, a lot of the steps between multiple traits and this are going to require that you have sort of an internal idea of how Punnett squares can work, so that you don't have to constantly revert back to, um, you know, drawing out the square every time. I will say that drawing out the squares, especially your first two times, might be useful, but especially a lot of this stuff on the side here, you would want to write this out every single time, because that will really start to slow you down. If you remember the last, uh, the last video that we looked at was multiple traits. So how do you take something like eye color and hair color and then height and combine it all together and find one overall probability? If you remember when we did that, we just took the individual probabilities and multiply them together to get one final probability uh, for all of those traits combined. Today's lesson is going to take that and go a few steps and beyond so that uh, one of the classic things that we look at is eye color. So in eye color, this is one of the first traits that we looked at. You, uh, depending on the alleles that you get from your parents, you know, if you have a, a, a brown allele from one parent and a brown allele from another parent, you'll have brown eyes. If you have a blue allele from one parent and a blue allele from another parent, you'll have blue eyes, as in this cute little baby that's on the screen. Uh, the weird one for the first time that people look at it is always, what happens if you have one brown allele and one blue allele? What we learned, uh, and what we've been practicing for the last a uh, few weeks is that the brown allele becomes dominant in, to the blue allele, so that all you see is the brown allele. What we're going to do today is actually expand on this a little bit. Uh, we've sort of been using a simplified version of how inheritance works, uh, because there's lots of other ways that inheritance can happen. So not every trait is just as simple as uh, dominant versus recessive. So if you take a look at the cat here, you see that there's really multiple color cats. Uh, it's not just the brown cap, and it's not just the black cap, but you can have a cap that's both brown and black with some white in there as well. Or some flowers. The way flower mating works often is that if you have a certain color flower, like a red flower, and you mix it with a white flower, you can actually get an intermediate color. Like in this case, you get a pink flower. And then chickens also work the same way with their coloration, where you can get multiple colors of chickens based on uh, what sort of parents, uh, what sort of genes the parents gave. We're going to start to put some names for some of these things. These are called patterns of inheritance. Now, again, we've spent a lot of time with one specific pattern of inheritance already, and that's what's known as complete dominance. This is where one allele is dominant to the other, and that the dominant trait is the only one that's seen in the phenotype it's expressed. So this is what we've been working with forever so far. So brown eyes are dominant to blue eyes. Brown hair is dominant to blonde hair. Uh, freckles and earlobes and all those traits are examples of complete dominance. Now, most traits that we see in nature follow the rules of complete dominance, where if the dominant one is there, it will essentially mask the recessive one. And if you remember why, it's pretty much based on a darkness scale, or you know, if it's there, it will happen. So, um, 
so the, the melanin is, is darker than the, the full melanin, which will allow brown eyes to be dominant in blue eyes. So even if you are making the blue eye straight, you don't see it because it's so light. All right, that's an example of complete melanin. However, there are certain traits from certain organisms that work differently. And an example of that is called incomplete melanin. This is when neither allele is really dominant to one another, and that if you have both, you'll sort of mix both together at the cellular level. All right, this is called incomplete dominance. And I'll show you an example of this in a second. The final one is called codon. This is when alleles are actually equally dominant to one another, and you'll see them both at the same time within an individual organism. Now I'll say that these two can be a little bit tricky to differentiate from each other, that being incomplete dominance and codominance. Uh, but we'll take a look at some examples to hopefully uh, clear up what the, what the difference is between the two points. The example we're going to look at uh, is a totally fictional fruit called the kikuti berry. All right, now in kikuti berries, there are uh, two different alleles. There are red alleles and there are blue alleles when it comes to kikuti berries. So as we look at the kikuti berry example, we're actually going to start with complete dominance as a because that's the one we're most familiar with. Again, we've been dealing with complete dominance this entire time so far. So this is brown eyes and blue. So if we take a look at complete dominance and kikuti berries, you could be given a, well, let's grab a pen for a second while I'll look at this. Uh, you could have either a red allele and a red allele. You could have a blue allele from one parent and a blue allele from or you could be given a red allele from one parent and a blue allele from the other parent. Those are sort of our options. Because remember, you only have two alleles for each trait. So those are our only two options, as you can see. So what I want to start to do is identify then what these would look like. So let's say that you were given a red and a red. All right? If you had a red allele from one parent and a red allele from the other parent, the berry color itself would be red. All right, now if we think about if you have a blue allele from one parent and a blue allele from another parent, you would expect that berry to be blue. It's the only allele that we have. Now remember the middle, the heterozygous, the one with uh, one of each allele, was the one that maybe was succeeded at the start. What would happen if you had a red allele from one parent and a blue allele from another parent? In this case, I'd have to tell you which one was dominant. Right, because in complete dominance, whichever one the dominant is, it's over. In this example, it just so happens that red is dominant to blue. So if you have a red allele from one parent and a blue allele from another parent, you'd expect that berry just to be red, just like the normal red red one. Alright, now that's complete dominance. That's the thing that we've been going through. An example for our last seven lessons. So that's being one of the Let's take a look at one of the differences. One of the new ones that we just learned about. One of these new ones is called incomplete dominance. So incomplete dominance is where that neither trait is actually dominant to the other, so it's beginning to mix them together. Now let's say that both homozygous phenotypes are still easy to figure out. Because just like before, if you had a red allele from one thing and a red allele from the other thing, you would still still expect to get a red berry. And likewise, if you had a blue allele from one parent and a blue allele from the other parent, you'd still expect to have a blue bear, a blue kikuti. All right, where incomplete dominance and codominant structure differ is in the heterozygote. So what happens if you have one allele of each type? All right, incomplete dominance says that those traits would actually mix with one another, so that no longer would you have a red bear. Nor would you have a blue bear. What you would actually get is a mixture of red and blue together. So you would expect the heterozygote to actually be purple if we're using the incomplete dominant pattern of the All right, now that's a new thing for us. We've never seen this mixture trait before. All right, in that, especially in that heterozygote. All right, now codominance is again going to be the homozygous, the one you have the same allele, it's going to be simple again. Because if you have a red allele from one parent and a red allele from another parent, you'd expect to have a red berry. And if you have a blue allele from one parent and a blue allele from another parent, you'd expect to have a blue blue berry. However, codominant, again, it's that heterozygous that's 
we're using this short code down in it, that heterozygous, so if you have one red allele and one blue allele, we get our both traits showing at the same time. So in this case, what you get is a red berry with blue spots, or you could get a blue berry with red stripes, or you get a berry that was sort of blotchy red and blotchy blue. The key here is that you see both the red and the blue at the same time. All right, in photo. So this is a quick example of uh, what the three different patterns do. Now I want to clear up one thing about this question: that all traits only follow one pattern. All right, and whatever pattern they are, that's the one that's the key. When I give this example for Kahuti berries, it's not like Kahuti berries can be multi dominant, two things can be dominant, and co dominant. They'll actually only do one of them. You have to know which one it is. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to um, you're going to pause the video in a second and practice question number one when you talk flowers. And it's, it, it's almost exactly the same format as the example we just put together, where you're going to see what the possible flower colors would look like if it were each of the three types. So you want to try question one now after you pause the video. And once you finish answering the first question, play the video again and we'll go through the rest of the questions. So hopefully now you've had a chance to try out question one. So let's go through the answers together. So if you take a look, and this question is asking about flowers, it's a red flower, a red flower, and a white flower, so the one on the we're cross-threaded, 100%. They are and still are flowers, they mold. And there's, what we're looking for now is what would we expect if we use each of the three patterns in here? Alright, A says, what would the phenotype, what phenotype would be seen according to the rules of complete dominance? Now remember, this is the one that we've used all the time so far. So we should be most familiar with this. So we see that uh, in this case, red has the big R's and white has the little R's. So we would expect in this case, red to be dominant white. So if we have a heterozygote, which would be a big R, little R, we would expect in this case, the flower to be red. Because red is dominant white. All right, now that's the thing that we've been working on a lot so far. So that should be pretty familiar. But these other two options are going to be the new ones. But what we get if we see an incomplete dominance? So what phenotypes would be seen according to the rules of incomplete dominance? The big R little R. Remember, incomplete dominance says that the trait will mix with time. And what we would expect there is we would have some red mixing with some white. And what we would get are flowers that are pink. According to incomplete dominance, because that's what this problem is. Last but not least, what if we follow the rules of codon? Right? We have a red allele from one parent, a white allele from another parent, we mix them together. We would actually expect in this case to get a red flower with white spots. Or you could also have said a red and white striped flower, or a white and red speckled flower, or maybe the flower is white with red spots. We don't really know until you read them, and often these will look different. That's why I like if you're going to look at cow spots or something, they're not even the color distributed in the cow. All right, now one last thing for clarity, too. Remember that um, all traits only work in one of these ways. It actually happens that the way flowers work, all right, most flowers actually follow incomplete dominance, like the rules of incomplete dominance. So for most flowers, they don't follow the rules of complete dominance, and they don't follow the rules of co dominance. They actually follow the rules of incomplete dominance. And that's why, like roses, for example, do look so let's try these with a little, with a few more uh, examples for clarity before we try mine as well. The two examples that we're going to look at, we're going to look at some uh, colors of horse fur, all right, and we're also going to look at some different blood types. This is what we're looking for the blood types. So we're going to use that as one of our examples. All right, let's start off with horse color. Uh, so common horses that uh, that are, are used across the, across the world, really. All right, come in a lot of different colors. But one specific breed of horses that we're going to look at come in three colors. It comes in brown, white, and this sort of mixture here in the middle all right, that is known as calamino. Uh, and if you take a look at it, it's much, kind of much more like a tan, a sort of light color horse, as opposed to the brown or the white that are on the side. Now, the way horses work is that in order to get a brown horse, you actually have to have two brown alleles. So all brown horses big B, big Q, because they receive two brown alleles. All right, now, 
white horses are the opposite end of that. In order to have a white horse, we actually need two white ponies, making all white horses little these little. The difference comes from the heterozygous, that palomino. In order to get palomino, you have to have both alleles together, meaning that you have one brown and one white one. Now this is an example of incomplete dominance, where the two alleles mix with one another, so we give a resulting heterozygous that looks different for either homophobic. Right? Now there's some questions that you can answer that will help you if you understand incomplete dominance. So question two on the paper is that the horses, some genes for hair color, so we can put down. And the genotype there is found. Brown horses are big to big to white horses are little to little to And a big to little to genotype creates a yellow reddish color. That's not the deal. You want to calculate the offspring genotype ratio, different, and then it gives you three different mating Now, one thing to clarify is when it says calculate the offspring genotype ratio, essentially you're looking for the percentage of the two different genotypes. Remember, the unique thing about incomplete dominance and co dominance is there's actually more than two phenotypes. In the past, it's usually worked on genetic problems. So there's two phenotypes. So you're either brown eyed or you're blue eyed, brown hair or you're blonde, or you're dimpled or you're not dimpled. In this case, with incomplete and co dominance, we're actually usually looking at more than two. It could be three or four different phenotypes. With the horses, there's specifically three. You could be a brown horse, you could be a pino horse, you could be a pino horse. So now let's take a look at these combinations. We're looking at a brown horse breeding with a white horse. All right, now the only way to get a brown horse that we saw before is that you have to be big B, big B. Remember the horse that we looked at before, the only way to be brown is to be big B, big B. What that means is that one of our parents has to be big B, big B. Remember, the big B little B is big enough brown. The other pair is a white horse. So in order to get a white horse, remember we learned that you have to be little b, little b. So we split that out as well. We mix together in a square. And what we'll see is that 100% of the horses that we get are heterozygous. So if we made a brown horse with a white horse, what we'll see is that none of the kids will be brown and none of the kids will be white. In fact, 100% of the horses will actually be palomino. After going through this example, what I want you now to do is, you know what, you can try questions B and C on your own. All right, you should pause the video now, try questions B and C, and when you, after you finish trying them on your own, press play and we'll go through the answers together. So you should pause the video now. you had some success with both of these questions, so let's take a look at them and see how you did. B says a brown horse mated with a palomino horse. So if we look for this example, we know a brown horse has to be big B, big B. Now in order to get palomino, it actually has to be a big B and a little B. So if we do this punch of out, we'll find that we'll have 50% of our horses be big B, big B, and 50% of our horses be big B, little B. All right, what does this mean? Well, it means that 50% of our horses are big B, big B, and 50% of our horses be palomino, and we won't get any white horses. All right, our last example is a palomino horse and a palomino horse. That means that what we're going to mix together is a big B, little B, and a big B, little B. Right now, this is just called a heterozygous cross, just like we've normally done. So what we'll see is that we'll actually have all of our phenotypes represented here. All right, we have one square that would be a brown horse, 25% could be brown. These two in the middle will both be palomino. We can add about 50% palomino, and at the end, we'll have 25% of our horses be white. Right? At this point, if you got the three questions right, you should feel pretty confident about your ability to use incomplete dominance to calculate percentage. If you haven't gotten these right at this point, you should go back and rewatch this section again and try some more problems on your own and make sure that you get it before you move on to code. Alright, our 
next example is going to be for codominance now, instead of incomplete dominance. And this is going to be using blood types. In humans, there are four different blood types that exist. It can either be type A, type B, type AB, or type O. And this is solely going to be dependent on the type of protein that exists on the outside of your red blood cell. All right, now blood types become very important when it comes to donation. You can see in the table um, on the handout that you uh, picked up in completing codominance, it sort of outlines who can donate to who and who can receive blood from who. All right, you'll notice things that like uh, type A um, is pretty specific and B is pretty specific. There's also uh, certain people who can take any type of blood, so like A, B, A, B, or O. Then there's also people who are known as type O, they, they can actually donate their blood to anybody. And this is why type, uh, often blood banks will really encourage people who are type O to donate their blood uh, because it's useful everywhere. Uh, anybody who comes in an emergency, if you don't know what their blood type is, you can give them type O blood. And just now, how does this work? Well, the tricky thing here is that there's actually three different possible alleles that we have. Uh, Typically, when we've looked at traits before, there's only two of them. There's either, you know, a uh, big, big B or a little B. Or there's a big B or there's a little B. There's a big H or there's a little H. And there's only two of them. However, when we look at blood types, there's actually three different alleles that exist here. So let's go through these in a little bit deeper. So if you have in your box, if one of the two alleles that you have is the A allele, that means that you are going to be making A protein which in our example back here, we're denoted by little green lines. All right, that means the outside of your blood, you're making um, A protein. If one of your alleles is a B allele, that means that you will make B protein on the outside of your red blood cell. Right, and those are denoted by these little is an I allele, that allele actually doesn't code for A protein, nor does it code for B protein. So if you have I, it actually doesn't code for either one of those proteins. Now this is where it can get a little bit tricky, because if you think about type A, there's some obvious answers here. If we wanted to write in the genome for each one of these uh, types of blood next to them, there's some obvious answers. So for type A, when you have an A allele and an A allele, you're going to have type A blood. And if you have type B blood, you're going to have a B allele and a B allele. And if you have type O blood, you notice that there's not anything on the outside here. This is all blank. So that means that you're not going to make any proteins with either of your alleles. It'll be I, I. All right? And then with AB blood, you see that you make both triangles and you make circles. So that means one of your alleles must be an A, so that you're making the triangle. And the other allele must be a B, so that you're making um, B protein. This is where codominance starts to get kind of weird, that you actually express both traits, that, and you express any trait that you have in the exact same time. Right? So if you have AB blood, you have A protein and B protein. But now, if you take a look at our four genotypes that we have listed, if you're thinking through this, you might realize that there's actually two more genotypes that are possible. Alright, so uh, we've given what happens if you have an A and an A, and a B and a B. And we've also talked about what happens if you have an A and a B together, and you have an AB blood. Or if you have two I's together. But if you're really paying attention, you might notice that another combination is that you could get an A from one parent and an I from the other parent. And what this means is that you will make A proteins with one allele and no proteins with the other allele. And so that actually means that you will still have type A blood. All right, this is an example of a heterozygous, where you have an A allele from one parent and an I allele from the other parent. So you're still going to have type A blood. The same holds true with type B, is that you can receive a B allele from one parent and an I allele from the other parent and still have type B blood, because one of your alleles is still making B. Alright, now this is all the possible genotype combinations. There's actually six different genotype combinations for blood. Alright, 
even though there's like four phenotypes, there's six genotypes that are possible, which is something new. We haven't really dealt with it. So let's take a look at um, question three from the work that you picked up. All right, if we take a look at the question, it gives you a table which outlines a lot of the information that we already talked about. So it gives you your blood type. So in this case, um, our possible blood types are O, um, or AB, or A, or B. Those are your four possible blood types. Okay. It also tells you then what genotype will give you each one. So if you have type O blood, the only way to get type O blood is if neither of your alleles make the protein. So you need I and I. All right, now if you have type AB blood, that means that one of your alleles must be making A protein, and one of your alleles must be making B protein. So that means your genotype has to be AB. Now remember for type A blood, we learned that there's actually two genotypes that will get us there. Both of your alleles can make A protein, or even just one of them can make A protein, as long as the other one's not making anything else. And the same holds true for B. So if we take a look at these options, it gets a little bit trickier here because we have six possible genotypes of four phenotypes. Also what's located on here is just some really interesting information about blood donation and how it works. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, you certainly can. Um, but we're not going to spend a ton of time on that now. All right, so let's get to the questions to see how we do. We're going to go through 3A together, at least the first part. 3A says write the genotype for each person based on the description. So if we start with A, it says you are homozygous. Now, if you remember, homozygous means different. So your two alleles are different with type B blood. Okay, so if we've got type B blood and we're looking for a genotype, let's go to type B for two possible genotypes, either BB or B Okay, now which one of those is heterozygous? I'm sorry, homozygous. Right, the only one of these that is homozygous is big B, big B, because that means that both of the are the same. So in this case, if you are oh, have a homozygous phenotype with type B blood, you have to be big B, big B. Take a look at the next one. The next question says heterozygous with A blood. Okay, so look at A blood. These are our two possible phenotypes. And if we're heterozygous, it means our two alleles have to be different, which means that we are A and I. All right, now, um, three says you have type A blood and had a type O parent. This is where a lot of your experience using uh, like level two funded squares is going to start to come into play. Because what you should recognize is that if we have type A blood, Again, there's two possibilities here, AA or AI. However, it also says that one of our parents is type O, meaning one of our parents only had I donors. They were I, I, meaning that the only one, only kind of kid that they could have, they could never have an AA kid because they didn't give them one of their eggs, which means that they can only have an AI child. And this one is also a I. All right, now four and five are just more about donation. So it says blood can be donated to anybody. So we look at um, our column right here that says blood to donate to. And in this one right here, we actually see all four possible blood types. And so in this case, we know that type O then can donate blood to anybody. And then the next one says can get blood from a type O donor. All right, now who can get blood from a type O donor? So if we look, can receive blood from, here's an O, and here's an O, and here's an O, and here's an O. So actually all four blood types um, should be here for this question. So who can get a blood, who can get blood from a type O donor? Anybody. Now you'll notice that the question, oh, I'm sorry, the question says only. So that means we have to start limiting our answers. The only one that can, the only person that can get a blood only is type O. Meaning that if you are type O, you can only get blood from another type O. All right. Alright. Okay. Alright. 
If there's two questions you want to try on your own, now let's test them out. The B answers. What you want to do at this point is you want to pause the video and try question B and question C. Right? These are sort of like real life examples of why blood typing is useful. Once you finish questions B and C, you want to play the video again and check your answer. Alright, hopefully at this point you've answered questions B and C, so let's go through the answers together. For question B, let's pretend that Brad Pitt is type AB and Angelina Jolie is type O. What are all of the possible blood types for their baby? Alright, so if we know Brad Pitt is type AB, type AB means his genotype has to be AB. So what we can do is we can put Brad Pitt at the top. All right, now Angelina Jolie is type O. If she's type O, the only genotype that she could have is II, which means that she will go right here. All right, we fill out our punnett square. Sometimes we bring in Brad Pitt's A's and his B's. And what we see is that we have two genotypes in our table. We have two out of four that are AI, and two out of four that are BI. All right, from an AI perspective, that means that their kids will have, let's see if we find some AI, AI is right here, which means you make A proteins on one allele and no proteins on the other, which means that you will be like A. And BI works the same way. That means you make one, one of your alleles is making B proteins and the other is making nothing, which means that you will be type B. So the two possible blood types that their kids could be are type A and type B. Which is interesting because it would neither of their possible options are the parents' phenotypes. We notice Brad Pitt is AB, but none of their kids can be AB. And Angelina Jolie is type O, but none of their kids can be type O. So it's just really interesting to think about when you have six possible genotypes in the way blood types work, is that it's possible for these two people to have kids where neither one of the kids has the same blood type as the parents. All right, and let's take a look at the last thing here. Two parents think that their baby was put to the hospital, right? This used to be a big problem before they used the tags and everything in the uh, modern hospital system. Uh, it's 1968, so DNA fingerprinting does not exist yet, so you can't just go out and do a DNA test. All right, however, we do know at this point in time that the mother has type O blood, and the father has type AB blood. And the baby has type B blood. Was the baby switched? Well, again, this is actually very similar to the last example with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. We know that one parent was AB, one parent is II. That means that their kid could either be AI or BI. Well, we know that their kid had type B blood. Do we see type B blood represented in this table? In fact, we do. There's a 50% chance that they'll have it. Which means that it's possible that this kid wasn't switched to be their kid. Right? Now, we don't know that for sure, but um, was the baby switched? Well, we'd probably say in this case, no. All right. Now, if you've had so much practice and watched the video, you want to go through and watch this incomplete, or you want to try this incomplete and go down and ask questions on your own four through eight. After you feel really comfortable with those, you want to take the uh, incomplete and go down this quiz. I just want to remind you that this quiz does have multiple trace tracking to it as well. So you want to make sure that you're comfortable with multi trace tracking before you um, go to tax that. If you're confused about any part of this, please go back and watch the video. Uh, this can get a little bit tricky. Uh, but if you feel like you're ready to take the quiz, good luck.